What's up, MMO Huts community? This is Dizzy PW reporting in from Warsaw, Poland. We are at the Wargaming World of Tanks Grand Finals, and we have the Master of Esports right here, Master of Ceremony. He's got all kinds of titles with Master in it. Can you please introduce yourself to our audience and tell them what you do at Wargaming? Hello, guys. My name is Mohamed Fadl, a bit known as Mo. I'm the Esports Director of North America and Europe for Wargaming, and it's my pleasure to welcome you here to the best, greatest, biggest event ever in the history of mankind. Fantastic. So how did you get into the uh, esports side of Wargaming? It seems like you are very passionate about this <laughs> game, so I feel like there must be some story behind it. <laughs> uh, but yeah, in the end, we had no esports in the beginning, to be honest. We were mm -hmm. community department, community driven. We made some fun tournaments in the beginning, and then suddenly it kicked off somehow bigger and bigger, and the community really pushed us hard, hard to create more and more tournaments. And then we had this big demand to create the Wargaming League within our top teams because it's, hey guys, we want to show the world how good we are. So, uh, and you're right, as I'm a very passionate player myself, I said, yeah, why not? To earn some cash extra as a professional should be easy. So um, after the first few rounds, I realized it's not for me. I should stay to what I do. And uh, invited the best teams worldwide for the first roundup. And we realized this is something that has potential. We had to work a lot, don't get me wrong. We had like changed it like 50 times, but it had potential. So on that note, it is pretty wild that after being already an established eSport, you took such a strong change with the attack defense mode. What gave you the confidence to actually make this switch? <laughs> the pro teams. The pro teams, they, we knew our game was a bit of campy. Let's be honest, campy, passive, not that fast paced. So it felt like, mm, it didn't feel right. When we all sit down and ask global teams, we work with them six months on, the, months on this project, it was like the hardest project really ever because you have like each region comes with 150 players in the Skype chat and then they start all to give you feedback. So we realized, okay, we have to change the whole process. But when the teams came up with some very cool ideas and we said, hey, we never thought about this. Maybe we should really adapt two maps. Maybe we should make it more even that you can't see the maps no matter where you are, that you can't cover both maps, or you can't camp. So, so much feedback came and the teams tested it hardcore, really hard. And then they came, okay, this is what we want. And then we started implementing it last season. And since then, all our numbers are skyrocketing. Participant, viewership, teams creation, action happening. So it's really, it was the right choice and the right call to listen to the players. On that note, in the next season, do you have any more changes in mind, such as perhaps maybe like a pick and ban phase to block your rivals from using the tanks they like? We had this, we had certain, uh, one first made certain arrangements. May we include, may it still happen, maybe, because we're still at the point we talk to the team, say, guys, what if, if you really, you choose first, you pick, then the other is banning. We, some of our regions tested it already, they used it already, and it changed the game completely to a different level. So we have to really be very, very careful because, as you said, we made a massive, massive change. Mm -hmm. So first we have to see how does this run? How does now the first big event, the grand final, runs with it? How smooth is it? Take then the feedback and then make the next step, hopefully the right one. So eSports is getting really serious these days. And as uh, we were talking a second ago, it gets pretty bumpy doing these shows <laughs> on the road. Is there anything you've learned from this event to uh, improve in the next season? Yeah, hell yeah. I just even look out of the window. We have a venue here for 2,500 people, and we were thinking, okay, it's going to be fine. we would be nice and cozy. <laughs> yeah, we came in the morning, 8 o'clock, four hours before the opening, and we saw a queue. And we realized, okay, this is our first learning. We should have gone way bigger. So then we even we built up a TV outside, two of them last minute, really last minute called another one tonight. Overnight, they built another TV for the queues outside. So we have, like yesterday, 10,000 people in total for an event which fits 2,500. So I said, okay, we had, there are a lot of learnings. Let's say it like this. And we need to be bigger next year. And more food trucks for sure. Yes. When you see the, really, in the, in the peak time when everyone runs out, when like there's a break, and you see the food trucks, like a queue is then for like half an hour, and they say, ah. Oh. But in the end, we have already four food trucks. So I thought four food trucks is enough. Everyone thought so. <laughs> <laughs> so have you guys considered using the rising popularity of Wargaming's eSports as a way to promote your other two games in the lineup? It's hard to say. We, I don't think we want to do this at any time with mm -hmm. eSports because eSports is something which is driven by the community. 
We, you need a community. You need a critical mass of community to drive esports. No matter what, you can't do it vice versa. You can't. It's uh, we were best example because we had no idea to make esports in the first place. The community pushed it on us. So I strongly believe, if you try to promote and force something down in the community, hey. Look at this product, play it, it's eSports, it doesn't work, it doesn't work. What we will do, especially warships now coming out soonish, mm. that we give them a base, like a, a potential ladder system, a tournament system where people can start very grassroots style, building their own teams, mm. compete on a very low level, and then we will closely focus it and look at it, will it change the behavior, will the, some superstar teams uh, come out of nowhere, then we will make the next step, but we won't force it down. So that brings me back to the real meat and potatoes reveal of this tournament was the actual rise of the Bronze, Silver, and Gold League. Can you give us an overview of that system that you're going to be implementing next season? Um, so we want to create a career path, a system which allows the player from home who's like a casual Joe to really, if you want to step up, to have a very clear vision, next step, what can I do to reach the next level? So we have the Bronze, bronze League, the Bronze level in our system, which is like including ladder system, fun tournaments, uh, con single player tournaments, a lot of things which just uh, everyone can participate in without having any commitment or needs really a team, a strong team or any... Co but just to make the first step to say, hey, is it something for me? Do I like the competitive market? Is it something I want to play with my friends? Then at this level already, we try to connect players. We mm -hmm. want to create, an, uh, we were creating right now, so we hopefully publish it within the next month's uh, mod which allow teams to sign up from in-game, in the client. They sign up in the garage to tournaments. They can highlight certain players they want to play with. Hey, I played with you last time. You don't know me, but I want favor, uh, to put you on my favorite list. So next time I see you playing, maybe I can join you. Hey, let's play together. So at this level, Bronze, we try to connect people, connect talent. Then the Silver is more like the semi-pros because they already have established system. They have a hard team. These guys already have the chance even to participate in big tournaments like WCA, where they can win $100,000 partner to, uh, tournaments. These guys, we have like a system which allows them to have a real league. It's a real league system with seven versus seven. They have points, they have rules they have to follow. And they get something in return from us. We give them the visibility, meaning if a team is quite good or wants to be promoted, we promote them to our channels. We give them viewership. We give them connections to sponsors. We, build, we help them to build a brand around themselves at this level. And then we have the top, the 12 gold teams in each region. These are the superstars. Of, often they have already partners. Mm -hmm. But what we plan to do is we give them salaries. This year we start and give them salaries, each region 750,000 USD for the 12 teams. Half of this money will be paid out by, based on their ranking, meaning like in a normal league, the best one gets the most prize money salary and it goes down to the last one. The other half will be paid depending on their creation of content. How good are they to create a brand around themselves? Because our vision is that these top 12 teams are able to sustain without our help in the end. That we don't need only wargaming. They can, so a good example, I want, let's say, school bus. Mm -hmm. Hey guys, uh, go to Twitch, create a fan base, do something. If you reach these and these numbers and these and the popularity, you get a massive bunch of salary pond on top of your normal price money. Mm. The idea is that they will do this then. Mm -hmm. And then they realize, hey, wow, cool, we made some extra money from Wargaming. But then they get money from Twitch. They get money from YouTube Live. They get money from additional sponsors because they have a big audience. And then they realize, hey, wait, we get way more money from the other sources than even from the league. So we are not depending on this league only. We can really focus on what we love to do, esports, without being afraid if something changes, if something the league changes, whatever changes, the product changes, the game changes, that we left without anything. So the goal is that the people really can even drop their job, mm. have a living, complete living from their team, from their brand, and not be scared, hey, maybe tomorrow they shut down everything. What happened then to me and my family? Mm. No, they have an income which allows them to do what they love. That's fantastic. I'm just going to end it on a lighter <laughs> note. Me and the other guys were kind of joking and curious. Do you guys choose which girls carry the flags of which teams, or is there some kind of secret drafting system going on backstage we don't know about? Uh, it's a very good question because I saw them as well. I said, Who, who's deciding that? I saw already. Funny thing is, and this is sadly true, I have seen the girls now the first time here, those nice, friendly ladies. And then I saw suddenly like 50 guys coming to be the referee to say, okay, who should be where? Like, hey guys, who, by the way, are you? <laughs> I've never seen you before, ever. So I think they have an own system backstage with a lot of very passionate young gentlemen to decide 
who should carry which flag and the, for sure they help a lot to help those ladies who carry those flags. Fantastic <laughs> interview. Thank you for your time. Thank you.